I've decided to talk to you tonight about risk. And I hope you'll, you'll forgive me, but this will be probably the most personal um, speech I've ever given. I typically talk about concepts in psychology, and I'll do some of that. I talk about concepts in history, but I very rarely use myself as the example. Um, and I hope you'll forgive me for using myself as the example tonight, but here's the reason I'm doing it. Not because my story is particularly interesting. I'm sure a lot of you have a lot more interesting stories than mine. But the goal here is to provide an example for all of you to believe that you can do the same thing. So I want to talk about, I want to talk about risk. Um, and I want to use myself as an example. Um, and I want you to understand the importance of risk in your life. So I'm going to ask you this question, and I want you to write it down. Writing is the magic act. As soon as you write something down, it becomes real. And I want you, when I do my work with my coaching clients, I ask them what I call the eight most important questions. And this is one of those eight most important questions. Who's going to take care of you? I don't want you to think about it real long. I just want you to write it down, okay? Who's gonna take care of you? Because we're gonna come back to this. So I wanna give you a little history about me. And again, not because my story is interesting, but because it's an example of how you can change your life. There was a study once of 70, 70 year olds. And they asked these 70, 70 year olds at the end of their life, and if you talk to people who work in hospice and people who work in nursing homes, they'll have a very similar response. They asked these old people, if you had to live your life over again, what would you do differently? Not one of them said, I'd like to spend more time behind the desk. They all said, things in these three categories. The first category was, I wish I would have spent more time in quiet reflection. I wish I would have spent time thinking about things a little bit more. I was so busy all the time. I was running around chasing the kids. We were putting them in the minivan and getting them to practice. And then we're going here. And then once the kids got off to college, you know, I was really working on something. And I was just trying to move up the corporate ladder, trying to. I never spent time thinking about my life and what I wanted my life to matter. So that's the first, first R. The second R is they said, I wish I would have built something that would last beyond my life. And for some of you, it's the Great Pyramids. You want to build something you know, like a bridge or a building that will last beyond your life. But for most people, they said, the thing that I want to last beyond my life is my relationships. I wish I would have built into more people's lives. And the last R, which you can probably figure out given the title of my talk, was I wish I would have taken more risks. I wish, you know, I, th I thought about, you know, pulling up stakes and moving across the country, but that was just a lot of trouble and didn't want to do that. And, you know, I always wanted to open my own store, but I didn't want to do that. And, and I was afraid. So I never did. And I wish I would have gone back to school and got my education. I wish I would have. And they spend a lot of time in regret about the risks they didn't take. And that's where I want to spend time to, tonight is what risks are you not taking? Now, let me, let me, um, let's put a little moderator on that risk thing. I, I told one woman who's a student of mine, I told her the three R's of old age education, and she comes back to me two weeks later and says, Roger, it's really good you told me that. My husband and I started talking about it, and we decided we were going to take more risks. And I just really want to let you know how much I appreciate you telling us that. And I said, oh, that's great. I'm really glad. So she said, so when this company called us on the phone and said if we gave them our credit card number, we could get a free cruise. <laughs> so thanks, Roger. <laughs> Don't do that. 
Okay, these are calculated risks. These are not throw your money in down the sewer risks, but calculated risks. Each of your lives is valuable, and one of the presuppositions I have about life is that life is a risky event. You can't get out of bed without taking a risk. Most of us never think about it, but our lives were built on taking chances. And I love this quote, a ship in harbor is safe but that's not what ships are built for. A ship in harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. You're all ships. You're all, you can all live safe. You can all stay in the harbor of your life and never try anything new, but that's not what you were built for. Ladies and gentlemen, you were built for something more. I don't have a slide for this, but this is one of my favorite quotes. It's from Carl Jung, who was a psychoanalyst, a Swiss psychoanalyst, a student of Freud. And I'm not a big fan of Freud, I'm not a huge fan of Jung, but I love this quote. He said, the worst form of child abuse is the unlived life of the parent. The worst form of child abuse is the unlived life of the parent. Your children are watching you, and the choices that you make are determining what they think is acceptable or unacceptable in life. So you are creating their future by letting them know what is and what isn't an okay thing to do. You may have your boat moored in the harbor where it's safe, but that's not what ships are built for. So here's where our, here's where our story starts, or my story starts. It starts on farms in the Depression. My mother grew up in Kentucky. Her father was a World War I veteran. He was an ambulance driver in World War I. He married a young lady when he got back from the war, and they settled down together and eventually immigrated to Kentucky, where the people are poor and not very smart, and everybody thinks they're backward. I lived in Kentucky for a while. It's not that far off. <laughs> That's where my mom grew up. She was ashamed of being from where she was. She tried very hard to change her accent. They moved to Illinois, then moved to California, lost their life savings, moved back to Illinois in the Depression. My father lived on a farm very similar to this one. His parents were tenant farmers, which means at some point the family lost the, their own farm and then they took up farming for someone else for pay, which meant that most of the profit from the farm went to the owner and they had just enough food that they grew themselves and a little bit of money. My dad said when the depression came, Prior to the Depression, there were photos of all of his brothers, and my dad was born in 1929, and he says, there are no photos of me because we couldn't have formed film. So they grew up very, very much without money. Here they are. They met in 1958. My dad was a Korean War veteran. He had come back from the war. He had gone back to school, wasn't sure he was going to make it. He said if it wasn't for the GI Bill, he would have taken a job pumping gas at a gas station. But he went to Illinois State University where he met my mom, who had been working at State Farm as a secretary, and her boss said, Carol, you have more to life that you can offer than just working as a secretary. I want you to go to school. So on his advice, she, she figured out how to get some funding and, and got to Illinois State where they met at a Methodist um, college group at a square dance. And they actually liked square dancing all the way into the 70s. Um, they met, they fell in love, and they got married. Both coming from very, very humble beginnings. Children of tenant farmers, failed businessmen, and they decided they would start a life together. My dad said during the Depression, if they hadn't had the garden, 
they would have starved. My mom, as a result of that, was always afraid that they were going to run out of money. My mom didn't go hungry a single day in her life, but was always afraid that there wouldn't be enough food in the refrigerator. Do you guys have people in your family like this? She was always afraid there wouldn't be enough, and she would save everything to the point where frugality is a good virtue, but frugality can turn malignant and turn into a fear that is all-consuming, and both of my parents had it. They believed that they could become destitute. And they, my dad, instead of pumping gas, went to college, got a degree, got another degree, got another degree, and became a professor. And he took a job um, at a university as a professor of agriculture. And my dad worked from 1965 to 1995 at Ohio State where he had a very good job. But both my mother and my father were afraid of poverty. They were afraid, deathly afraid, that they would be out of money. And so my dad and mom took a bet. And here was the bet. We're going to go to a large institution, and that large institution will take care of us for the rest of our lives. And for my parents, who have just celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary, and my dad is still collecting a pension, it has been a good bet. That was a good bet for them. But my parents were risk averse. They were afraid that something, would, they wanted everything with a guarantee. And so they were afraid their whole lives of being poor, so they always wanted to make sure there was no risk to their money. Guess who caught some of that? I grew up as the son of a university professor, and there were two things in my life which were the most stable things in my life. And one was the backdrop of that university, and the other was our church. And those were two institutions that I believed would never betray me. So when it came time for me to get a job, a young man who had been inculcated in the fear of poverty, that one day I might be poor, I spent time trying to figure out where would I go, how would I get a job, how could I make my way in the world, and I really figured I would end up as a university professor or an employee at the university. And lo and behold, guess what? I got a job at a university. This is the building I worked at at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. And I was so glad I was in a university. It was a world I know. It was a world I knew and it's a world I still know. I still like walking across university campuses. I understand them. So there I am in the basement of the Ball Gym for the, it's a funny name for a gym, isn't it? So I'm in the basement there, I worked there the first year, and my boss comes to me, and it's time for you know, our performance review, and she says to me, Roger, you've done a really great job, we're so excited to have you here. Um, and I looked at the lay of the land, and I had been hired a year after three other people had been hired before me, and I'm looking at the people on the staff, and I'm looking at my advancement, and I'm thinking, you really don't have anywhere to move in this job, Roger. You really don't. Nobody's going to be retiring for the next 10 years. Three people are in front of you in line for these positions. There's no opportunity for advancement. But then my performance review comes and she says, Roger, we've been so pleased with you. You've done such a great job. Don't tell anybody. But everybody's getting a cost of living increase of 1.2%. And I've been given the freedom to give you to give certain people more. Yeah. And I'm going to give you the maximum I can, which is an additional 0.6%. So you're going to get a 1.8% raise. And I'm young and dumb, and I'm thinking, I'm a rock star. 
And I go home and I tell my wife, I'm getting a 1.8% raise. And she says, that's good. I said, that's more than anybody in my department got. And she says, that's awesome. And then I looked up what the consumer price index was for that year, and it was 3%. And then as soon as my raise went into effect, I realized it was $50 a pay period, and they were increasing the amount of parking by $100 per pay period. <laughs> and our health insurance cost by $150 a pay period, and I thought, wait a minute, this is an advancement. I've had a job and I just got less take home, and I'm not keeping up with inflation. And I don't got any room for advancement. This sucks. <laughs> so I decided I needed to look for other opportunities. So I go home for Christmas, go visit my family, and my pastor of my old church says, Roger, we would love to have you come work at our church. We would pay you X amount, which equaled what I was making at the university, and we'd only ask you to work part-time, then you could use your office here and you could start your own practice. And I'm thinking, hey, I just see my way for advancement with the other trusted institution of my life. So I go take a job at a church. And I'm excited. And so I get this job and I'm, you know, I get to move back to my hometown and my son gets to, my eldest son gets to be with his grandparents and my wife who's eight and a half months pregnant, you know, we're gonna have this second baby and I'm getting my stuff unpacked and I walk down the hall and I talk to my boss who's the senior pastor. I said, so where, you know, we talked about health insurance, you know, when am I going to get that paperwork? Because, you know, my wife is going to have this baby here any minute. And he looked at me and he said, well, I didn't think you wanted health insurance. And I said, I just quit a job with health insurance. And we talked about, oh, I didn't think you were going to want that until after the baby was born. <laughs> no, I want it now. Oh, okay, well, we'll get on that. I'll let you know. And I walked down the hall from his office, and I had an epiphany, which was, no one will take care of me as much as me. That my two trusted institutions in my entire life, the university was not going to take care of me, and the church was not going to take care of me. I decided I needed to take care of myself. So what do you think I'm going to do with this job at the church? You think, okay, he's got a PhD, he's got an advanced degree, he's going, to, he's going to make a good decision. How long do you think it took me before I left the church? One week? One month? One year? Two years? Maybe three? Four, five, got to be five. No, it took me six years to leave the church. And you know why I left the church? Because they fired me. <laughs> you really got to screw up <laughs> to get fired by a church. And I got fired. And when I got fired, all of my friends said, this is the best thing that has ever happened to you. I didn't believe it. By the way, I got an advanced degree. It took me six years to figure this out. Yeah, I am not a smart man. <laughs> You're all thinking it, so I'm just, letting, you know, I'm just helping you out. It took me six years to figure out this wasn't going to work. Do you want to know why? because I had the fear of poverty. I had a tremendous fear that I would be poor, and that kept me in the false security of these two trusted institutions that I didn't want to get away from. Now, I don't think this is a particularly interesting story, and maybe you don't either. I hope we can turn the corner here to be somewhat more interesting. The reason I tell you this story is to give you an example that I had a belief that I have had since childhood that it took me until my 30s 
to realize wasn't true, then how many years, ladies and gentlemen, did it take me to figure that out? Six before I could operationalize it, and they had to kick me out the door. So what did I do when they kicked me out the door? What am I going to what am I going to, I'm going to look for another job. So I search high and low for another job. I got one job offer, one, after looking for six months, one job offer. And the job offer had a no compete, which I affectionately call the strangle your mother no compete clause. And they said to me during the interview, oh, and just to let you know, we have sued two people into bankruptcy when they tried to go against this. And I'm thinking, boy, you sound like a real friendly organization. <laughs> so I passed. I decided not to do that. I decided instead to open my own practice. And again, we got a little, <laughs> yeah, overcoming fear. So why did it take me six years? Why did it take me six years? because I had to overcome an ingrained fear that had been in my life since childhood, the fear of poverty. Now, you guys have all heard about how do you overcome fears, right? There's a, there's a technique, like if you have a fear of snakes, that's our slide here, if you have a fear of snakes, they used to have this, this means called systematic desensitization. Anybody hear about what systematic desensitization is? A couple of you? So what they do is they have you imagine like this, this not so scary thing as it relates to snakes. And so, so there you are, you imagine, okay, so I'm on the same city block as a snake and the snake is in a cage inside a glass encapsulated thing inside a locked safe. Okay, I don't feel too bad. But then you increasingly imagine getting closer and closer to snakes. Okay, I'm in the same room as a snake. Okay, I'm sitting next to a snake that's in a cage. Uh, and those of you who don't like snakes are not going to like this part of the talk. And then, I, then I'm sitting and the snake is out in the room being held by somebody who knows how to handle snakes. And then, well, now the snake is next to me. And then you imagine that you're holding the snake. Okay? And then they, what they do is, is they have you imagine these progressively more aggressive snake images and then do like this de deep cleansing breath and relaxation and go to your happy place and all that crap. Because it is. Do you know what they found when they put poop people through systematic desensitization? Do you know what cures people of the fear of snakes? You want to take a guess? Handling real snakes. That's how you get over the fear of snakes. Well, I had the fear of poverty, and I had never touched poverty. I'd always had a steady paycheck. I'd always had insurance. I'd always had everything taken care of. And then it all evaporated. And I didn't have a steady paycheck, and I didn't have health insurance that I wasn't paying for for myself. I didn't have any of that security. I didn't have a retirement account that anybody was going to contribute to except for me. And who was going to take care of my three kids and my stay-at-home wife? Well, I guess no one is going to take care of me more than me. So let me tell you how I overcome that fear. I'm going to show you. This is a picture of my office, 37 West Bridge Street, Dublin, Ohio, the old firehouse. I'd go in that, uh, under that second awning, that middle awning there, and I'd go up to my little office, and then I'd wait for clients to come in, and they would come in. I started out as a clinician. I didn't do the work I do today. And there I'd sit, and I'd wait, and I'd talk to a person for 50, 50 minutes, and they'd write me a check for $85, and they'd leave, and I'd give them enough time, and then I'd get in my car, and I'd drive 0.7 miles to the bank. I would sign the check, deposit, put it in, look at my account balance, okay, I got enough money right now. Then I go back to the office, and then the next client would come in, and they would write the, me the check for $85, and I'd wait an acceptable period of time, they'd leave, and I'd drive back up there. <laughs> I went to the bank as many as four times a day because I was so afraid of running out of money. Got to make sure this isn't there. If I, just dump it, if, I, if I just dump checks in four times a day, I'll have enough money. And I watched that money like a hawk. Anybody ever had times when you've been like that? 
where you've gone to the bank. Anybody here gone to the bank four times in a day just to make sure they had enough? Just, oh, it's just me. I made that little trip a lot, depositing back and forth because I had the fear of poverty. Anybody in here have the fear of poverty? Afraid that you're going to run out of money or have been at a spot where you've been so low on money? All of those trips, 1999, 2000, when what happened in 2000? The dot-com crash kept going, kept, kept figuring it out. Every day I'd wake up and figure out how do I make money and make that little trip back and forth, back and forth. What did that little trip do for me? What it did was it changed my brain. I had a pattern of thinking that gets laid down on what are called neural pathways. And the fear of poverty was a neural pathway that I had a four-lane superhighway going. And I had to cut a new path of, I can make this. I can support myself. I can figure this out. No one is going to take care of me more than me. But it took all of those 0.7 mile trips in the car going back and forth and all of that repeated trials. It took me six years to get there and then it probably took another six years before I figured out, okay, I can make this work. So how many of you have heard the consultant lie? And here's what the consultant lie is. It only takes six weeks to learn a new habit. How many of you guys have heard that? Yeah, lie from the pit of hell. I mean, it's just not true. Do you know why it's not true? I mean, how many of you, somebody hand me your smartphone. I left mine, at the, I'm not gonna make a call on it, but just hand it to me so I, it, yeah, thanks, thanks David. So how many of you have one of these smartphones? I, I, let me ask it a different way. How many of you still have a dumb phone? <laughs> None of you, one of you, okay. So how long did it take you to learn how to interact with a, gla a piece of glass with your finger? Yeah, this one doesn't like me. How long did it take you to, to interact with a piece of glass? How long until you figured that out? I mean, are you, not long, right? How many of you, when you got your Blackberries, I know I'm in Canada, so I'm like, I'm, I'm not pandering. I really am asking the question. How, many, how long did it take you to learn to thumb type? Not very long. Thank you. Do you know why it doesn't take you very long to learn those habits? Because those are brand new habits, right? They're brand new. You've never had to learn them before. I mean, your only previous experience with drawing on glass is when you were on the bus going to school. <laughs> and if you were on the short bus, I don't need to know. But that was your only experience. You learned how to do this really quick. You learned how to thumb type really quick because it's a brand new habit. But you're all grown-ups. You're not trying to start new habits. What you're trying to do is replace a bad habit, a well-ingrained bad habit. And that well-ingrained bad habit is really hard to change. When I was here last time, did I tell you my toothbrushing story? I was 33 years old. I'm in the dentist's office. I got a lavender bib on. And the dental hygienist finishes cleaning my teeth. Any, any dental hygienists in here? Because I'm going to insult you. <laughs> I'm trying. Dental hygienists have a class on guilt and shame. Do you guys know this? <laughs> right? This particular dental hygienist had taken the advanced class. So there I am, and she says to me, well, you see, as, as I look at your teeth, I can see by the buildup on your, on your teeth of the plaque that you're a scrubber. Like I had just pushed an old lady down the stairs. And I said, you got me. Yeah, I'm a scrubber. She goes, you know, it's important to do circles. And I said, I'm totally on it. Yeah, you got, I, I know, I won't forget that. She goes, just in case. And she turns her, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh. She turns around, gets in the cabinet, and brings out that giant pair of choppers. Remember that they bring to school with that giant toothbrush the size of a, you know, a small hatchet, right? With a little, 
rubber pointy thing on it. You got it. And she goes, watch this. And she goes, you see, I'm doing circles. And I said, I will never forget this. I got it. She goes, now you try. <laughs> okay, I've never forgotten it, right? So that night, I have been sufficiently humiliated into circles instead of scrubbing. That night, there I am. Circle, 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 spit. Circle, 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 spit. Circle, circle, circle. Ooh, nice. Next morning, I wake up. Circle, 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 spit. Oh, crap, I'm late. <laughs> I start scrubbing again. How long did it take me? I have one bad habit. I'm replacing it with a nearly identical good habit. How long did it take me? Six weeks? It took me years. I'm 54 now, I finally got it. I mean, I'm doing circles now, but it took me a long time. So when somebody tells you, you need to change your habit, it'll only take six weeks and all of you have tried and you've never been successful, that's because you're replacing a four lane super highway of neurons in your head with a little hiking path rolling through and meandering through your brain and you're not very good at it. It's going to take years for those neurons to grow and it takes a long time. So if any of you have the fear of poverty and want to get over it, it's going to take you a long time. And if you have any other fear, if you have any other compelling problem, it's going to take you a long time because you have to practice and rehearse it. And that's going to create those new neurons in your head. What I learned from reading about people who were successful is there's a fundamental difference between being out of money and being poor. What I learned is I will never be poor. Not because I have scads of money, because believe me, I know what it's like to shift money around and try to figure out how to avoid a late charge. And I've paid overdraft fees, and I know what that's like. Anybody in here know what that's like? You don't have to admit it. Okay, I know what that's like, because I've been broke. I've been out of money, but that's not the same as poor, because poor is a mindset. Poor is, why won't somebody take care of me? Broke means I don't have any money, I gotta figure this out. That's a mindset. If you think somebody should take care of you, you could be poor. But if you believe, I gotta figure this out, you'll never be poor. You may be out of money, but you'll figure out a way to make money again. You may not be living in the mansion that you dreamed about, but you will never be poor. That was a mindset that took years for me to change. Someone who went 30 something years of his life with one set of beliefs, it took about a half a dozen years for me to figure out that's not it. And then I stumbled across this book. And how many of you have ever heard of Herb Cohen? He was a strategic arms limitations talk negotiator, a hostage negotiator. He negotiated multi-million dollar media deals. And he gave me a life philosophy because his negotiating strategy was this. I care, but not that much. Ladies and gentlemen, that is my life-defining philosophy. And you, see, you say, that sounds awful. So let me give you an example from his book. He's just flying home from France where he's negotiated a multi-million dollar media deal. He's got a really big check in his shirt pocket and he's feeling pretty good. And what he says is, what you need to know is, I charge by the day. I don't charge a percentage of the deal. I charge by the day. So if my client does well, it doesn't really matter because I'm getting the same amount of money if my client doesn't do well. It's just, it's a day rate. So I care about the outcome, but not that much. And guess what? He usually won because he didn't care too much about the outcome. So he walks into his front door, he's greeted by his wife and his daughter who say about his 11-year-old son, you need to do something about that kid. 
And he's like, what? Oh, Mr. Master Negotiator, think you're such a big deal. You can't even get an 11-year-old to clean your room. Who? what if the media picked up on this? Mr. Famous Negotiator can't get his son to clean the room. He says, well, I'm going to do something about that. He says, I marched back to my son's bedroom. This was no longer about his bedroom. This was about my legacy. How do you think that negotiation went? His 11-year-old cleaned his clock because he wanted it too much. He cared too much about the outcome. Now you're saying, well, that seems like a pretty apathetic life. But if you're a Buddhist, you say, well, that's the middle path. That's non-attachment. If you're a Christian, you go, oh, that's thou shalt not covet. Coveting is wanting something too much. By the way, if you look at the Ten Commandments, it's the only one that has no external behavior. The first one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That one, there's nothing you can see about that. The rest of them have behavior until the last one, which is covetousness. You shall not want that that much. That's kind of what covetous means. So the Tenth Commandment is... You should care, but not that much. So I have a pen in my pocket. It's a $30 pen. If I decide I can't lose this, this is the most important pen in my life, this, this is everything to me, what does this become? This becomes my idol. My precious, I love my pen. This controls me, and if I allow this to control me, this will get me into trouble. But if I say, hey, Dave, you want a pen? Thank you. You're welcome. Maybe, could, could I have that back? It's a kind of different pen. Could I have my pen back? Oh, okay. <laughs> but here's the deal. If he said no, I would say, okay, enjoy it in good health. I can go buy another. This doesn't make me happy. And what happens is that if you want something too much, you believe that thing, that experience, that relationship can make you happy. I can't. It won't. I mean, it might entertain you. It might be pleasant. It might be beneficial. But it won't make you happy. And so I learned in that space of six years of rewiring my brain, telling myself, if I want something too much, if I become too attached to something, it will own me. And my attachment to not being poor owned me. And it was when I gave that up and I learned, oh, it, it doesn't have to own me. It doesn't have to define me. I can figure this out. That's when I got freedom. And having that life philosophy of not wanting things too much is the secret to power and freedom. You want power and freedom in your life? It's about attacking that fear of poverty, taking those risks. Now, don't go give your credit card to people on the phone who are going to give you a free cruise. <laughs> but your secret to power and freedom is caring but not that much, realizing that things outside of you do not have to control you. So the number one fear that gets in the way of people's success is the fear of poverty, and I had it in spades. And the other fear that gets in the way of all of our abundant lives, lives is coming up in a minute. But I want to tell you this, why is it that we have so much difficulty with change? We hate to change. We're always afraid of change or we're upset by change. So I'm going to ask you a question. How many of you guys ever watched old westerns? You guys ever watch old westerns? The old black and white westerns from the 50s, early 60s? Yeah, maybe some of them in the 40s. You've probably seen this. So when I was a kid, growing up in the 1970s in central Ohio, we had four stations. I don't know what it was like here in Manitoba. We had four stations. We had ABC, CBS, NBC, and PBS. I'm like 11, 12 years old. I'm sitting on a brown beanbag chair with a bag of Doritos on, or Fritos on my chest. Saturday morning in February. It's too cold out to play, right? 
my gloves are wet, so I'm in there watching TV. So it's February. What's on CBS? Well, in the 70s, it was the Los Angeles Lakers, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Skyhook. Do you guys, anybody remember this? You kind of knew how it was going to turn out. The Lakers were going to win, the Lakers were going to win. So there really wasn't any reason to watch. Change the channel. Oh, you didn't have a remote. You had to get up and turn it. So you turn to ABC. Well, ABC, there was hope because there was this show called The Wild, Wide World of Sports. Does anybody remember this? Okay, so it's February, so I got my fingers crossed that it's the guy on ice skates jumping over the barrels. Did you guys see that? Please, please let it be. No, it's ice dancing. Oh, I'm an 11 year old boy. I don't want to watch people going around in circles dancing on ice skates. Turn the channel, go to the PBS channel. What's on PBS? Opera. Say no more. I'm on NBC. What's on NBC? It's this Western. And I know you've all seen it. Do you guys, you, so here's how it goes. Bad guy with his group of other bad guys rides into town. What color is the bad guy's hat? It's black. He rides into town. He's always got a Mexican wearing a sombrero. He's got the double bandoleros, right? He's got two six shooters. They all ride into town, right? You've seen it, right? They're shooting up the town. They shoot the water barrel. What happens? The water, okay, so they throw stuff through the, the bar window. People are hiding behind stuff. You guys have seen this, right? They shoot up the place. They rob the bank. They're riding out of town. And only one man is brave enough to chase him. And it's Jeb. What color is his hat? White. You've seen the movie, right? So he gets on his faithful horse, Suki, and they gallop off, riding after the bad guys. Now, I got a question. You don't have to answer this with a show of hands, but how many of you ever shot a gun, a handgun? Okay. How many of you ever ridden a horse at a full gallop? Okay. How many of you ever shot a handgun while riding a horse at full gallop? Oh, no. Okay. So here's, <laughs> I see you. Yeah. So here, here's how it goes. Jeb draws his six-shooter. This is how he's really going to be going, <laughs> shooting everywhere. Jeb draws out his six-shooter and, boom, squeezes one off. Who does he hit? The Mexican. You've seen the movie. <laughs> they always shoot the guy from out of town. You knew it. Okay, so that, that guy falls off. And the head of the, uh, of the bad guys, we'll call him Bart, he turns around and over his shoulder at a full gallop, because you've seen the movie, he squeezes off around and he shoots Jeb. So where does he hit Jeb? Uh, not the hat, no. It's the shoulder, and it's always the non-dominant shoulder, right? It's never right between the eyes. It's never gut shot. It's always, you know, it's, he wings him in the non-dominant shoulder. Jeb falls, so you've seen the movie. Okay. Jeb falls off his horse. The bad guys get away. At this point, I don't care that the bad guys have gotten away. What I care about is what does Suki do? Okay, you've seen the movie. What does she do? She turns around, right? And she gallops back to the barn. And then there's an old geezer with a pin in the front of his hat. He's got suspenders. Hey, Suki's all lathered up from a run. Where's Jeb? I don't know. Let's get a posse and find him. Right? You've seen the movie. Now, here's my question. Why does Suki go back to the barn? Because that's where the food is, right? But here, think about her life. Think about her life. A man takes the skin of a dead animal and throws it on her back and straps it on her, cinches it up tight, shoves this piece of metal in her mouth so he can yank her left and right, rattling it on her teeth. Then he has the temerity to get on her back, which is exactly where a mountain lion would sit if he's about to kill her. And then he has sharp things on his feet that he kicks her in the side with. Hey man, if I was Suki, and that guy's on the floor of the canyon, baking in the hot, hot sun. I would be doing the little 
Mustang dance. Boom, 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 right on Jeb's head. And I'd ride off with the Mustangs. And I'd, you know, get that, that saddle loose and pull that bridle off. And I'd go free. But why does Suki go back to the barn? Because of habit. Because Suki knows the way. And human beings, I hate to break it to you, ladies and gentlemen, you're just like animals. We will go back to the barn because we know the way. It's not objectively better, but we know the way. When you guys vote, how many of you in your voting say this to yourself? Well, better the devil I know than the devil I don't know. That's why incumbents keep winning. It's because, well, I don't know what the new guy will do. I don't know what the new lady will do. We'll just keep the old one. At least we know what we're going to get there. Why do abused women go back to abusive men? Because they know the way. It's a predictable way. So we will stay in our risk-free life unless we decide consciously to do otherwise. That's how we're built. Our brains don't like to have to think that much. We'd just rather go back to what we know than something new, which is why we don't take risks. And here's our second other fear, the fear of death. Now, a lot of you have read that the fear of public speaking is worse than the fear of death. Well, I'd like to give you a little caveat on that. People aren't afraid so much of the concept of dying, it's how they're gonna die that bothers them. If you were to say, are you afraid of dying? Well, asleep when I'm really old? No. <laughs> I'd rather not give a speech. Well, how about four years of chemotherapy with colon cancer? Okay, I'll give the speech. It's how you're gonna die, okay? We're all afraid of dying to some degree or another but it's how we're gonna die that bothers most of us. Back in ancient Rome, there was a school of philosophy called the Stoics, and they get a really bad rap. They get a really bad rap. Like they didn't care about pleasure and they didn't care about life, but here's the thing about the Stoics. The Stoics had a philosophy about how life worked. And one of the most famous Stoics was Marcus Aurelius, one of the four good Roman emperors. And their central belief is that you have power over your mind. This is a quote of Aurelius. You have power over your mind, not outside events, not money, not death. Realize this and you will find strength. Our strength our vigor, our lives comes from our ability to know. We don't control what happens outside us. What we control is inside us. There's a Shakespearean quote from Hamlet that says, nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Our thoughts drive our reality. Now, if you're thinking, oh my gosh, Ancient Roman philosophy, you're killing me, man. I read Aristotle, I read Socrates, I read all that stuff. That's boring. These guys, this is stuff that you read for about 15 minutes and you go, wow, that was really good. And then you put it away and then you take it out for 15 more minutes. Oh, that was really good. The Stoics are different. Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, Seneca, you read these people and you go, oh, that's, that's really good. I mean, I can understand that. But Marcus Aurelius has another famous quote. It is not death that a man should fear, but he should fear never beginning to live. Sorry, that got cut off there. He should fear never beginning to live. Most of us live lives that are safe. But that's not what ships are built for, is it? We can be safe and take no risks. If we're afraid of dying, we'll never really live. But isn't it interesting? But let me give you a little modern version of this. How many of you have heard of Albert Ellis? In psychology, he's one of the fathers of a, a branch of psychotherapy called cognitive behavioral therapy. It's the only one that's been shown to be more efficacious than a placebo. 
Ellis said, I took most of this theory from the Stoic philosophers. So this ancient Roman philosophy has now infiltrated modern psychology, and it's the only one that really works. So if you want to read up on Ellis or see him on YouTube, feel free. Make sure there are no kids around. He loves to cuss. I love this quote. Life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke thoroughly used up and worn, totally worn out and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. I mean, do you want to live your life like that? Do you want to go to, go to your funeral, make sure you've got a well-preserved body, or do you want to go out well? One of the central elements of Stoic philosophy was that your life could only be fully lived if you didn't fear dying. And that's a hard one. I certainly don't have that one mastered. But it's certainly an aspirational goal that our fear of poverty, our fear of death, keeps us from taking risks. However, our risks are not always what we think they are. So, What's the way you are most likely to die at the beach? You're at the beach, sunny day, warm. There you are in the ocean. What's the way you're most likely to die? Anybody call it out. Drowning. 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 Good guess. Incorrect. Lightning. Good guess. Incorrect. Anybody else? Sunstroke. Good guess. Incorrect. Shark. It's shark week. Incorrect. That is the correct answer, a heart attack. Do you know why you're most likely to die at the beach from a heart attack? Because that's the way you're most likely to die, period. It doesn't matter where you are. You're most likely to die of a heart attack at the beach, at the mall, at home. We're afraid of the things that we can imagine, not the things that are real. <coughs> You're afraid that Jaws is going to come up and bite you in half at the beach as you're eating that double cheeseburger extra fries with mayo on it. <laughs> we are afraid of the things that are dramatic but not necessarily as dangerous. Let me give you some statistics from a British study. Maternal deaths in pregnancy, 1 out of 8,200. Surgical anesthesia, 1 out of 185,000. Look at rock climbing. Most of you think, man, I wouldn't do that. You'd fall off a cliff and die. 1 out of 320 climbs. What that means is that you're almost twice as likely, 1.7 times more likely to die in surgery and about 70 times more likely to die because of your pregnancy than you are on rock climbing. But a lot of you will say, I'm afraid of heights. I would never do that. You're afraid of the wrong things. And as I was telling somebody at dinner, I think about statistics and probability all the time. We are afraid of the dramatic things. We think risky are the dramatic things that we can think of. So what's the new smoking? Sitting. Sitting. And you're all doing it right now. Okay, so we are all at danger of a known risk when we are doing our normal behavior, but we won't do something different because it seems risky, because our imagination is so vivid, we think of those other risks. Those are the things that keep us from living a full and abundant life. We have these active imaginations that keep us from trying something new. How many of you saw Legends of the Fall? Legends of the Fall. The narrator of, of the movie is a character, Native American character named One Stab. And he's talking about the protagonist of the movie. He said, every warrior hopes that they have a good death, that a good death will find them. And the protagonist in this movie, Tristan, dies at 
at a, in a fight with a grizzly bear. And the narrator says, it was a good death. Many of us are so afraid of dying that we'll do anything to put off death, and it results in us having a bad death. The Stoics would say, no, a good death is a good thing. We're all, I hate to break it to you, we're all going to die. I hope none of you die soon. I certainly hope I don't die soon. But rather than being afraid of dying because it's all going to happen to us, what if we become concerned about having a bad death? How do we how do we run our lives so that we have a good death? How do we take our lives so that we live full and abundant and exceptional lives? You could choose the safe path because you're afraid of how it might turn out. Or you could decide, hey, life is a risky event. I love this quote from one of the U.S. former presidents. If you want total security, go to prison. There you're fed, clothed, given medical care, and so on. The only thing lacking is freedom. Life is a balance. The scales are balanced between security and freedom. It's really perceived security. There is no real security. It's perceived security. So the question is, what's the balance that you want? Eisenhower said he would lean toward freedom. It's your life. You get to live it any way you want. But if you want perfect security, live in a prison. If you want freedom, there will be risk. There will be unpredictability, and there will be difficulty. But here's my guarantee. It's the only good abundant life. A ship in the harbor is safe, but ladies and gentlemen, that's not what you were built for. You were built for something far more. Thank you very much. God bless.